Hey everybody, hey everybody, this is A1 Nick with the A1 Podcast. We have special guest today, attorney Victor Baki. How's it going, Mr. Baki? Good, Nick. How are you? I'm doing good, man. But unfortunately, we got to talk about some heavy stuff. Um, to give some context, there's a shooting that went on in Hawaii the other month of a 16-year-old boy named I Remember Skycap. The three officers involved, which have been sort of by shorthand called the three, um, are currently facing charges for murder and attempted murder. Attorney for one of the defendants, Thomas Otaki, just filed a very controversial and novel motion to dismiss the charges. Did you get a chance to review the um, motion? And what do you think about Mr. Otaki's motion to dismiss the murder charges? I did have a chance to review it, Nick, and um, there are several issues raised in that motion, um, but the one that stands out that everyone is talking about is that he is raising the issue, which I believe to be a correct statement of the law, which is that the prosecutors are not allowed to prosecute class A felonies and murder cases by way of preliminary hearing. The statute clearly states that those level of offenses can only be prosecuted by uh, grand jury by way of indictment and they cannot go through the preliminary hearing process. So in general, you just don't see class A felony cases and murder cases going through the preliminary hearing process anyways. So when you say that this is a novel argument, the reason why it's fairly novel is because the prosecutors just don't proceed that way. Now, whether they knew that they could or they couldn't proceed um, appears to be an issue because it looks like they could, but they always chose not to. And now they're trying to do it for the first time. And that's what makes it novel. And it, it's, very, it's a very simple lie. It just says you can't do it. Well, yeah, and it was incredible because once again, it's never really happened. And you've been doing this for close to 30 years now, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. And I and I've been licensed as a bondsman since 2004. And I used to go to the district court and watch preliminary hearings, preliminary hearings all the time. It was kind of like a fun thing for me to do as a young bondsman to sort of like get the lay of the land and check out all the attorneys and all of that. Well, the reason why we've never had it is because the prosecutors always take the case to the grand jury, and that is what they did in this case. The problem is that they were denied the charging documents. It was what they call a true bill. So they, the jury returned a no bill. That means they rejected the prosecutor's case. Now, what the prosecutor should have done is they should have represented the case if they wanted to pursue it to, a, to another grand jury. There are three grand jury panels that are um, impaneled every year and they sit for the whole year. So if you don't get your true bill on one panel, then you go to the next panel, then you go to the next panel. And if you strike out on all three, there's nothing to prevent the prosecutor from waiting until the next calendar year and then going ahead and trying with the next three grand jury panels. The problem is, is that somehow the prosecutors didn't know about this statute and simply decided, well, instead of trying to convince a bunch of lay people of their case, they're going to try the preliminary hearing process, which requires them to only present their case to a single judge who's trained in the law and, let's face it, is a government official. So they would, in this case, rather present their case from one government official, which is the prosecutor's to another government official, which is the judge. What they're doing is, is they're taking the public, that, that safety measure of the grand jury, they're taking that completely out of the loop. And they're used to going to the grand jury and getting everything they want because the grand juries are done in secret. There is no judge, there is no defense attorney, the defendant is not there. So there's an old joke that says you can indict a ham sandwich because why wouldn't you be able to if you're the only person in the courtroom presenting evidence? So what they're used to just getting a rubber stamp on, suddenly they were set back on their heels, so to speak, when they were told, oh, sorry, Mr. Prosecutor, 
we're not going to allow you to charge these three officers. And that sent the prosecutors into a tailspin. And for whatever reason, they decided now that they think that they'll fare better with a, uh, a judge in a preliminary hearing setup. Which is super interesting because as Judge Randall Lee, former Judge Randall Lee, who is a very well-regarded judge, highly touted judge, um, mentioned there were hearings on murder cases in the district court before. And as I published in my jail mail, well, there seemed to always be an intervening grand jury indictment. So you could have murder cases on the calendar, but traditionally before they even got heard, there'd be an intervening grand jury indictment and then the hearing would just be stricken or um, moot, however you wanna call it. So I do think there's a little bit of a gray area, but just to confirm, the law says the district court does not have the authority to indict defendants on class A fel felonies like the murder or the attempted murder for the three. The statute in question here says how cases can be charged. And it says that they have to be charged by either the grand jury indictment process, or they have to be charged by an information process. It says nothing about proceeding specifically to the preliminary hearing. So indirectly, that means that you cannot um, prosecute a case by way of preliminary hearing if it is a class A felony or a um, murder case, because by definition, those two levels of crimes are not eligible to be prosecuted by way of information, which is a third way of charging the cases. Hmm. And actually, I'm glad I have you on. Top attorney, former prosecutor, federal, state, you've done it all, military as well. I know about your history. I know about your career. Um, for the viewers and listeners out there, could you explain the three different ways that somebody can be formally indicted by the court? Well, first of all, we need to have some context here, Nick, and that is when the police arrest people, that does not mean you're charged. A lot of people think that when they get arrested and they have to post bail and they get a court date a couple of weeks or sometimes two months down the road, they think that they've been charged. And in most cases, that is not correct. All that has happened is they've been they've had probable cause by the police to believe that they committed a crime. They made the arrest, they get out, but then that paperwork goes to the prosecutor's office. And it's the prosecutor's office that decide whether or not to file charges. And then if they do, then the charge will obviously be set for the first court date, the same date that the person got when they bailed out. But here's the key that we really need to understand and most people don't, which is that the law says that for felony level offenses, actually the constitution of Hawaii actually says, that's the first point of authority. The Hawaii state constitution says the government cannot prosecute somebody for a serious criminal offense, which would be felonies and murders, unless first they are either indicted by a grand jury or they um, probable cause is found by way of a preliminary hearing, which involves a judge, or probable cause is found by a judge through what they call an information, okay? So the, the Constitution put these protections in there. What this means is that in felony cases, the prosecutor's office cannot just go in and just file a charge against somebody. They can only lodge charges with the court. And that's what you see right now with these police officers is the prosecutors have basically just filed a temporary complaint against them saying what they want to charge them with. Now they're asking a judge to sign to review the evidence and sign off on that. So to so to put that in context, this is all for the safety of the people. And a person who is charged with a crime can at any time waive 
the grand jury indictment. They can waive their right to a preliminary hearing. They can waive their right to an indictment because those three processes are all set up to protect the accused. They all serve the same purpose, which is just to make sure that there is enough evidence to at least justify putting a person through the horrors of the criminal justice system, also known as setting the case for trial, okay? Five second break. I hope you're enjoying the video. If you are, comment below, like the video, subscribe if you care to. It really helps us with the algorithms and it helps support the podcast. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So the, the, they all three do the same, same thing. So, but it's up to the prosecutor to choose which way they want to proceed. And there are limits to the way they can proceed. So for example, if they want to just take their case with the police reports to a judge in the judge's office, that would be called an information, but they can only do that for B and C felonies. That's absolutely clear. So they couldn't do that to these police officers. The other way they can do it, which they always want to do, is they want to take their case to a grand jury. And when they do that, it's done, like I said, in secret. So, of course, the prosecutors prefer that way. But when, in this case, you can't do an information, you can't do a grand jury indictment, that only leaves the preliminary hearing. But as we've seen, there's another statute that trumps the uh, constitution in Hawaii, and it narrows it. And it says for class A felonies and, and murders, you can't use the, it doesn't say you can't use the preliminary hearing process. And I think that's the gray area. And I think that's where the prosecutors have, have lo been lost. It says you either have to go by grand jury, which they tried and didn't work, or you have to go by information. And the definition of information is you can't do it for A. So that means by, by de facto reasoning, you cannot proceed as they are in this case. And I think it's very clear and I think, uh, I think they should lose. Whether or not the uh, prosecutors will uh, prevail, um, they may get it past the, the preliminary hearings judge, but I think on appeal, this will definitely come back. Wow, so this is gonna be very interesting because either we're gonna get clarity and we're gonna know for sure if um, the district court has the authority to proceed in class A indictments, or if they are able to do it, there's gonna be a appeal and then we'll have further review and then we'll see if it is permissible or not. So this is gonna be an ongoing thing. Correct, the, the saddest thing about this is that this issue is coming up immediately and it's, it's a jurisdictional issue. So if the court gets, it wrong and allows them to go forward, we could spend two years and hundreds of thousands of dollars on this case when the case was dead from day one because the judge made the wrong call. So this is what we call an appellate bomb. We make the argument, we pitch it to the judge. If it works, then it works. If it doesn't, then that doesn't mean the judge is right. It just means that we reserve it for appeal because you have to raise it in order to complain about it later. Wow, so masterful move by the defense attorneys uh, involved. They have nothing to lose by filing a motion to dismiss and then they either A, get away with it and they're able to get that motion granted or B, now they've just set up a way to appeal if they proceed. So that's a very, very shrewd move by the defense team, correct? I, I agree. Yeah, they, they have nothing to lose. Um, and, uh, and as long as it's not a frivolous motion, uh, which this definitely isn't. So um, it's a well-founded motion. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll see how it turns out. We may find out quickly or it may be, I'll give you an example, Nick, Bill Cosby. Bill Cosby is a classic example. In that case, he was granted immunity from prosecution. The prosecutors got a judge to agree with them that he didn't have immunity. They went through two trials, convicted him. Bill spent three years in jail only to have the Supreme Court come down and say, you know what? He had immunity. So from day one, that case was dead. None of that should have happened. And what does Bill get? He gets a Coke and a smile, you know? Uh, that's it. He doesn't get to sue. He doesn't get anything like that. It's, 
it's um it's just the way this system works wow crazy how i like to look at it as justice for the family or a penalty for the offenders this is like an area where it's like procedural you know what i mean it's not so much about what happened it's procedural like is it allowed in this certain court is this going to just be appealed and then reversed it seems more procedural as opposed to what actually happened getting to the bottom of was lethal force used um, was it justified or was it not justified well you're exactly right and most criminal defense cases are about 80 percent procedure and about 20% about what actually happened. Um, because the prosecutors and the government have so much power that these, as you say, procedures or rules, um, they exist to rein in and, and limit that power. Otherwise, you have the gulags and you have political prisoners and you have people rotting in, in the government jails, except for these procedures. Now, what is ridiculous about this particular case with these police officers is that it's not necessary. They can, even if, even if this judge says, no, you can't try, you can't bring a case uh, like this in front of the preliminary hearing judge, fine. They can still just go back and present it to the other grand jury panel again and again. Double jeopardy, the issue of trying somebody twice for the same crime does not apply to the grand jury. It only applies to what they call the petite jury or the trial jury. So that's why OJ Simpson got found not guilty. They can never go after him again, okay? But if they wanna try to indict somebody for something, they can present it to multiple grand juries. So this, this wow. whole nonsense about going to the district court in front of a judge to try to get charged that way, um, is really a, 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 an exercise in futility. And I can guarantee you the prosecutors re resent, or I said to not resent, but um, uh, regret every minute that they did because by doing it this way, they've now opened this can of worms that like you said, seems to be a novel argument. Nobody seemed to be paying attention to this statute, whether on purpose or just by, by the mere fact that they didn't bring class A felonies and uh, murder cases to it. But now it's come to the forefront. And I can tell you what, if there's going to be a problem, if we go back now and look at a couple murder cases, and if there were cases that were indicted or that were charged, I should say, by the preliminary hearing process, and it's now deemed that that was improper, those cases are all going to get thrown out and they're going to have to start all over again. Wow, so there's going to be ramifications for this case as well as once in the past. This is this is going to be a huge week coming up as the court um, sort of rules on jurisdictional issues, procedural issues. Right, and in fact, it has more effect and uh, and a more binding effect on the past cases. Like I said, this case they can just pivot and go another direction. But if they make a ruling that those cases should never have been charged from the past then then we go back and probably we'll have to start all over. Well, I do fear for political instability because, of course, if you could go back and do it all over again, you wouldn't have taken it to the district court. You would have just waited for another panel and tried to get the grand jury indictment with the other panel or the third panel. That's like hindsight. Of course, it's 2020. But what I fear is there was like hundreds of people at the district court supporting the officers. There were chants of free the three. And it was pretty crazy. Um, there's videos online of um, the attorneys coming in with um, their clients and like hundreds of people outside of the district court. If it was to go from, we can't charge them in the district court, we already failed um, at the grand jury. And then they try to take a third bite at the apple, fourth bite, even though it's legally permissible, I do fear that there might be some sort of political instability to follow. And you never know what that type of crowd, especially because it's the gun holder crowd, right to defend yourself crowd, um, the free the three crowd. I do have political instability questions about that moving forward if the indictments continue. I, I just have those, I just do. 
Yeah, but that that's just the nature of the beast. I don't think there's anything specific about this particular case. It's just that um, there's a lot of a lot of public outcry to support the police. But don't forget, the chief of police just got sentenced to federal prison for corruption for trying to frame somebody. So there's yeah. just as many people that don't trust the police either. So, um, but finally, I think you're going to see uh, in Hawaii what we've been seeing on the mainland, which is people actually being becoming involved in their surroundings and their community and their legal process and um, people taking to the streets. You know, hopefully it doesn't get violent, okay, and they don't start burning down and, you know, buildings and looting places, okay, but um, uh, yeah, this is, this has got, regardless of the, whether or not they're charged by preliminary hearing or indictment, um, as long as it's legal, you know, the other side's going to have to, to, to live with it because five second break. I hope you're enjoying the video. If you are comment below, like the video, subscribe if you care to, it really helps us with the algorithms and it helps support the podcast. Thank you where the the people that are supporting the police are wrong is that they're saying that just because the grand jury uh refused to indict him that that should be the end of it that's not the law nobody's saying that's the law everybody's saying that doesn't seem fair or that doesn't seem right but that that argument will never fly it's up to the prosecutor's discretion if they want to quit after one and say hey we presented it to a grand jury and the grand jury has spoken. And if they choose to respect that, then that's what people are looking for. They're saying to the prosecutor, why aren't you respecting the grand jury's decision? And they're saying, because we disagree with it and we're the ones that need to present it. And if they feel that there's a case, and that's where, that's where you have the real public instability is, well, what's the purpose of the grand jury then if the prosecutor can just overrule them and disrespect their decision? That's where you could actually see, or I could see coming in the near future, some type of legislation that says, or change in the rules that says, hey, the prosecutor can only present the case once. Yeah, that does seem like a great proposal. Of course, we're just talking on the fly. Um, we'll see if there's secondary or tertiary <laughs> results and consequences, but yeah, at face value, I. I do want justice, but I don't think it's right to just continually time and time and time again be able to, because it's it's a government overreach. And me and you had a shared client this week um, that I would say was a total victim of government overreach. Um, can you explain, so that we could sort of set the scene here with our shared client, can you explain what happened at the very beginning and how cooperative this client was all the way through to the point where he posted bail and then was sort of ambushed at court, threatened to be arrested again. Then luckily, thanks to you, had the opportunity to self-surrender, but it's really messed up and it is a government overreach no matter how you cut it for somebody to be charged once, but then have to like be arrested and then post bail two times. Could you go through that? from the beginning all the way through? Yeah, th th there's a, a huge problem with the way that the police and the prosecutors initiate the case. And it actually relates even into the police uh, officer's case, the, as you say, the, the three. So what the police like to do is, and especially in sex assault cases, which is probably more cases than I handle than any other type, is they call the, they call the suspect. And they just say, hey, would you mind coming down to the police station? We'd like to arrest you and then hold you in jail until you feel like giving a statement. And so, of course, that's when I get the call usually and say, hey, I've got a detective calling me. What should I do? So in this particular case with, with our client, Nick, I made arrangements with the detective. I turned him in. The prosecutors decided they wanted to file immediate charges and they set his bail at $100,000. So of course I called A1 Bail Bondsman and you guys jumped right on it and you, you helped him post the $100,000 and he was out. 
Several days later, when we show up for our initial court appearance, we find out that guess what? They went the reverse order of what they did in the police officer's case. They originally were going to preliminary hearing, but now behind everybody's back, they went to the grand jury and they indicted him. So now they want to arrest him again because the grand jury says that there's probable cause. So that again, that's just a different way of charging. But what has happened now is the police detective showed up there and wanted to take him into custody and make him post another $100,000 bail and had no idea or concept of anything that had happened in the first case. So luckily, you and I were involved early and we got enough notice and we were able to get him processed and released immediately without really being detained for too long and um, not having to post a secondary bail. So if you look at the, the officer's case, they did it the other way around. The prosecutors went to the grand jury, didn't get what they wanted, and then they went to the preliminary hearing. But here's the difference. And this is one of the things that bothers me about the way people are treated is the police officers, instead of being arrested like our client was and thrown in jail and held for two days, they just simply sent a letter to the police officers and told them, would you please show up at court on a certain date? So those guys had never been put in jail. They haven't had to post any bail. Why? Because they're police officers? I don't know. But what bothers me is that the police officer's case, that's the way everyone should be treated. And instead, they've treated other people like dirt and, and totally violated their rights. And people have been subject to repeat arrest um, repeatedly posting, having to post bail and being denied counsel because they've spent all their money on bail and now they don't have the resources to hire a, a private attorney. So there's all kinds of overreach that the community just doesn't see until they're actually you know, involved in one of these things on a personal level involving either themselves or a family member or a close friend. Yeah, and... I, I do have a few bullet points, um, me too, of things that I, I think need to change. Just because somebody has been charged, they post bail, and then they get indicted, it doesn't mean that that's now a brand new bench warrant that needs to be served. And then now there's a controversy of, hey, does the guy need to post a brand new bail when he's already posted bail? Or is the bail bond going to transfer over? Because that's up in the air case by case basis, you never know how the facility is going to handle it. And all of my career, since I've been licensed since 2004, all of my career, there's been a division. HPD does not recognize the bail bond transferring over and you have to submit a brand new bail bond. The sheriff's office who are actually delegated the task of serving the indictment recognizes the transfer and then you don't have to give a secondary bond. This case that we just had was the very first time in my career that HPD all of a sudden recognized that the bond transferred over. And I was grateful for that little baby step. At least now we know that there's a precedent where HPD will recognize that a bond transfers over from the district court to the circuit court. But all of my career, all 17 years, you know what I mean? I've been stuck in the position where some poor guy who is on their way to self-surrender at a near term, like, you know, maybe they got to go pick up their kids and they can't do it today. They'll do it tomorrow morning. They could literally just get picked up before court or at their house the day before they intended to go get rebooked. And they don't really have that opportunity unless, you know, they hire a private attorney and they have like a private sector guy for release like me to make sure that they could handle things quickly. That poor guy could have been in custody for another night if me and you weren't on top of things. And that, that really doesn't sit me sit with me well because it's so it's such an easy problem to solve it does transfer over you don't need to ambush a guy who's already posted bail especially when it's just a rebooking i get so frustrated and i just think the solutions are just so easy and it makes the workload lower for hpd the sheriffs you as the attorney and me it makes the workload lower when we don't have to all coordinate and spend half a day on one guy getting rebooked, oh, a second time for no reason. But no, you're absolutely right, Nick. And that is the way that it's been done forever up until 
our client. Our client was the first client that they've done this. And I reached out to my counterparts at the prosecutor's office. I uh, discussed this matter with the uh, sheriff's office. And what I've been informed is that as of now, just like this last week, there is a, there's a written memorandum of understanding uh, between the prosecutors and HPD that at least in regards to sex crimes and sex offenses, they have reached this understanding that HPD is now going to personally serve their own uh, warrants, which they're not really their own warrants, they're the grand jury warrants, but what was traditionally handled by sheriffs in a very orderly fashion is now going to be handled by HPD. They've just decided to take this on for a variety of reasons. The biggest one is they thought that the sheriffs were taking too long to uh, serve these warrants, but it's a complete waste of manpower. HPD investigates crimes. The sheriff's office do security and warrants and things like that. They don't go out and investigate crimes. So you're wasting the police officer's uh, energy and time and resources and their talent skill or their skill set, I should say. And it's just, uh, like you said, the problem with the bail process, Nick, for, for a lot of people is not everybody can hire private counsel, okay? And I don't turn my back on people who can't do that. I mean, I'm fighting every day for the entire community, not just those that can hire private counsel. But the public defenders don't get involved in the bail setup. They just don't because they don't get appointed until after a person has been arrested, can't pose bail, sits in jail, and then goes to court. And then they say, oh, either, either when you pose bail, somebody will come see you, or you have to wait weeks sometimes for a public defender to come see you. So those people really are at a, at, at a huge disadvantage with the government. And it's fortunate for the people that do come to see like you or me in the beginning or any private attorney, they can fight it and they can challenge it like what we did. Otherwise, you know, our, our client, you know, was on medications, they were going to actually have to take him to the hospital uh, if we hadn't gotten involved. So um, I think that was a big, uh, uh, a big fail, uh, maybe recently or this week for the, for the police department. Nice segue. We'll do our concluding segment of the podcast with wins and fails. But before we get to that segment, um, I will say it's totally America is a great country. I'm not going anywhere. I'd rather be here versus any other country. Bottom line, um, the ability for upward mobility, um, the ability to educate yourself. I mean, it's just number one, I've been to many countries as you have, and I'm not living anywhere other than America. But one of the other realities of America is, oh my goodness, you have to have like, you could, there's two things. You could either get sick and be bankrupted because of an accident of some sort or a sickness or something you couldn't have um, foreseen or legal like representation. You could be exposed to some sort of criminal liability. Those are the two. Your freedom could be at stake or your health could be at stake. And those two things can bankrupt you. So it really sucks. It's a reality, but you have to always like, I don't know, save $2 of every $10 you make. I don't know, invest well, save. You, you have to protect yourself because one, your health could go south or some crazy thing can happen. Somebody could accuse you of anything. And if you have to rely on the government to not just charge you with a crime, but then also defend you, screw that, you're not gonna get very good service. You have to be able to hire in the third party, the private sector, somebody like you or me to protect you because this country is just too crazy with income inequality, like the way that the government could be heavy handed. So segue, wins and fails. Let's be positive. Do you wanna start with a win or a fail? The floor is yours. Well, I, I had a case that fits right into that category. I had a big win this week where um, and it relates to everything back to the grand jury. So I had a case just this week, uh, just on Friday, the prosecutors informed me that they are not going to challenge my motion to dismiss a case that I've been working on for almost three years, a sex assault case, but the grand jury was defective. The government made a mistake back in 2018 and they impaneled a grand juror 
that was not uh, certified to sit on the grand jury. They put a they put a, a a senior on the on the panel when it was supposed to be the junior, and so they had the wrong person on the panel, and he wasn't he wasn't eligible to be a grand juror, and he voted to indict my client three years ago, and they finally found out about it about a year and a half ago. The prosecutors knew about it. They never said anything. And just now, about three, about a month ago, I finally became aware of it by, by basically accidents combing through the court records. And I found this, this discrepancy and I raised it by way of the motion. And now the prosecutors say, oh yeah, maybe there was a mistake. So now three years later, my client's been pending trial for three years. And now, because the prosecutors wanted to win their case rather than to do justice, um, they now are going to get their case. They have to admit to dismiss their own case. That just absolutely should not happen. Wow. So for me win. and my client, that's a big win. And it's also a big fail for the prosecutor. And it also goes back to the big three, which is you can't you can't just rubber stamp this grand jury indictment, this preliminary hearing process. It's there for a reason. It's there to protect people from government overreach from day one so that they don't get caught in these two, three, four year nightmares. You know, there was just a case I just read about just this last week or two where a guy spent almost five years in jail before the case was reversed by the Supreme Court. And when the trial judge, who was actually, I'm sorry, the sentencing judge, who was not actually the judge of the trial, the sentencing judge, when he was imposing the sentence said, this looks like it's wrong. I don't see how this is gonna stand. Nobody listened, nobody did anything. The guy spent almost five years in jail. And now and now the mistake is, is being, being brought up. So uh, those are big wins because it's better late than never, you know, but um, it's also kind of too little too late. You know what I mean? How do you get somebody's life back for the last five years? Bill Cosby, how do you get his life back for three years? Um, you know, procedures are everything. And the thing we have to remember is that the prosecutor's office is the one that's in charge of all this. It's not the judge. It's not the defense attorney. It's not even the police. It's the prosecutors. And look at what is that prosecutor's office has been a train wreck for the last 10 years. Steve Alm, I think, has done some good things uh, in the short amount of time that he's come in. So I have hope that uh, he will continue on that path. But then they pull something like this with the police department and you think, oh, my gosh, here we go. Right back to the same old government uh, overreach when it all costs. We're right all the time. Um, it's it's unfortunate. Okay, and my big win is the private sector. Newsflash, I'm in the private sector. I'm a private sector solution for people to get out of um, custody. You're a private sector attorney. Um, but there's just a certain responsiveness. There's like a certain quality or level of service that we're able to provide that just is absent and without like the 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 balance having an extra private sector solution when it's all government driven from the point of you're getting investigated by the um, police you're getting uh, charged by the prosecutor's office and conferred by the court uh, you have to go get sometimes arrested and then post bail a second time by um, a secondary um, law enforcement office like if there wasn't this outlet to counterbalance all the power that the government has, if there wasn't this private sector to fight for people, I mean, that poor guy, our shared client might still be in custody. Who knows? They might've sweated him out and induced some sort of fake confession. Who knows? Because as you know, they're allowed to keep him for 48 hours and they just call an investigation period. We all know it's just, you're sweating the guy out, hoping he confesses. Um, so my big win is, just having that third party, that private sector to like help against the stacked deck that the government has because they just have so much power. You need to have that counterbalance. Well, well, don't forget, Nick. I mean, I liked where you were going with the fact that there, 
you know, a person is investigated, like you said, by the government, then they are prosecuted by the prosecutor with the government. But don't forget, 70% of the people end up with a public defender. So 70% of all the people are also defended by the government. And then who's, who's in charge of the case? The government, a judge, another government official. So ex unless we have these small cases or the small percentage of cases where private counsel and private sector people are watching and guard dogging against these types of things, you can just see where people are run over, like unbelievably. In some countries, they have a panel of three judges. There is no community. And see, that's why that is what makes our system what it is. The system is not perfect, but the way it's set up, it's usually a really good plan. Just something goes wrong with the execution. Because if the police don't do their job, the prosecutor doesn't do their job, the defense attorney doesn't do the judges, if somebody doesn't do their job, the plan goes awry and we have poor execution. And I've always said this, I've argued this many times to the judge in, in really sad cases where uh, my client might've gotten intoxicated and hit somebody and killed somebody even maybe, but they're a good person. There's just something horrible happened. But I always remind everyone, and this is one thing I think everyone watching your video cast should take away is justice is not a verdict. It is the process. And if you keep that in mind, that's the only way you can keep from going crazy or becoming a true believer on one side or the other. It's the process. That's all we're entitled to. That is justice, is a fair trial, a fair investigation and a fair trial. The verdict always comes down on one side or the other. So, um, you know, that's, that's what keeps me going. That's what keeps me fighting because I can fight every case, whether I'm a prosecutor, whether I'm a defense attorney, whether I was the judge, it's all about making sure that process works. Because you mentioned earlier, oh, it seems like this is all about procedure. And it is, 80% of it is procedure because that's the process. That's what everything is focused on. The 20%, it doesn't take a long time to talk about what happened at a fight. You know what I mean? Or what happened when somebody got pulled over for DUI? It's not uh, that big, big part of the case, but it's the procedures that are in place that have to be carried out and executed every time to make sure that justice is served. Not about the verdict. As long as I get justice, I can live with any verdict. And I can't top that. That was a tremendous uh, conclusion to the podcast. Thank you very much for uh, joining the A1 podcast. And as you could tell, uh, Mr. Baki knows exactly what he's doing. If you ever wanted to reach out, um, how could people get in touch with you if they need some legal counsel? Uh, my website, which is arrestedhawaii.com. Also, they can always call me directly on my cell, which is 808-349-9757, or my office number 808-369-8170. Um, people don't get in trouble on a regular basis, so I answer my phone. Uh, pretty much all day and all night. That's, that's what's up right there. You give out your cell phone number. I really appreciate that for the listeners of this podcast. So thank you very much for uh, joining us on the podcast. Be well, Victor. Yeah, take care, Nick. Thanks for all your hard work. Hope you're enjoying the podcast become a patreon support the podcast link is below in the description thank you